Welcome to our digital campus. If you're new to our evening broadcast, we'd like to thank you for tuning in. Tonight, we'll continue our theme on doubt. This is our turtle, Turbo. He's trying to escape right now. And I've been wondering if turtles can doubt. His previous owner had him for years and told us that he wouldn't grow any bigger. So we also doubted that he would. At that time, he could fit in the palm of our hands. Since then, we found out that they were very wrong. And he must have doubted them too. He's probably three or four times larger now. Anyway, our speaker for this evening is Sister Debbie. I'll put Turbo back in his tank and see you after the message. Good evening. I'm so glad that you've chosen to join us this evening. It's always good to have you here. We're talking about doubt this week, and tonight we're going to look at the consequences or the personal cost of doubt. And then what can we do to minimize those consequences? So let's pray to begin. Oh Lord Jesus, we're all facing doubt right now, but Lord, we know that you are ruler over all, and we can turn to you, Lord, with our doubts. Help us, Father. Lord, since we can't be together in person right now, Lord, minister to us through these messages. Lord Jesus, help us to endure until we can come face to face again. Lord Jesus, touch us in this study in Jesus' name. Amen. So when I was thinking about the concept of doubt and planning for this message, there was so much material. I had asked my two um, developing leaders, Sister Dahlia and Sister Erica, for their insights, and I want to thank them for their input. This is a topic we could go on and on with. So let's begin with the example of the 12 spies from the book of Numbers and consider what doubt cost the Israelites. After leaving Egypt, the Israelites spent a year camped at Mount Sinai, where they entered into a covenant relationship with the Lord. Remember what they had witnessed, the power of God freeing them from slavery. They saw the Red Sea open. They passed through on dry land. And then they saw the Egyptian army try to pass through and be drowned. Remember that they had seen firsthand what the Lord could do. But they were a rebellious people. But God still provided a way for his presence to be with them. The tribes were even arranged around the tabernacle illustrating that God was to be the center of their existence. They were given the purity laws from God so they would know how to live. So God leads them out into the wilderness to go to the land that God promised to Abraham. But things really go downhill. The people complain and complain. They want to return to Egypt, to slavery. Moses had to even deal with his brother and sister being upset with him. There's doubt going on here. They're wavering. They're caught between trusting God, whose mighty power they've experienced, or going back to what is familiar, even if it is slavery. They're doubting that God will take care of them. They get about halfway to the promised land and Moses sends out 12 spies one from each of the 12 tribes, to check out the promised land. So let's go to Numbers chapter 13, and we'll be covering 13 and 14, some of the verses. So we're starting with verse 17 through 20. Moses gave these men these instructions as he sent them out to explore the land. Go north through the Negev into the hill country. See what the land is like, and find out whether the people are living, living there are strong or weak, few or many. See what kind of land they live in. Is it good or bad? Do their towns have walls or are they unprotected like open camps? Is the soil fertile or poor? Are there many trees? Do your best to bring back samples of the crops you see. It happened to be the season for harvesting the first ripe grapes. 
And I'm always amazed when I think about that single cluster of grapes they brought back. It's so large that two men carried it on a pole between them. This was a very special place. But when they return, 10 of the men report that there's no way they can survive against the Canaanites. So let's go to Numbers 13, 27 to 29. This was their report to Moses. We entered the land you sent us to explore, and it is indeed a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here's the kind of fruit it produces. But the people living there are powerful, and their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. The Amalekites live in the Negev, and Hittites and Jebusites and Amorites live in the hill country. The Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and along the Jordan Valley. But there were two spies, Joshua and Caleb, who said that God would save them. So let's look at Numbers 13, 30. But Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let's go at once to take the land, he said. We can certainly conquer it. Caleb and Joshua were remembering all that they had seen God do. They were remembering the covenant that God made with Abraham. So Numbers 13, 31 to 33. But the other men who had explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. They're stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report among the land, among the Israelites. The land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers. And that's what they thought too. You know, how they know what the descendants of Anak thought? Did they ask them? I don't think so. <laughs> the 10 convinced the Israelites that they should not listen to Joshua and Caleb. They make God angry by wanting to appoint a new leader and head back to Egypt. So let's go to Numbers chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. Then the whole community began weeping aloud, and they cried all night. Their voices rose in a great chorus of protest against Moses and Aaron. If only we had died in Egypt, or even here in the wilderness, they complained. Why is the Lord taking us to this country only to have us die in battle? Our wives and our little ones will be carried off as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt? Then they plotted among themselves. Let's choose a new leader and go back to Egypt. Well, God is not pleased with all this. So in Numbers chapter 4, verses 10 through 12. But the whole community began to talk about stoning Joshua and Caleb. But then look at what God does. Then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to all the Israelites at the tabernacle. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? Will they never believe me? Okay, they're not believing, they're doubting. Will they never believe me even after all the miraculous signs I've done among them? I will disown them and destroy them with a plague. Then I will make you into a nation greater and mightier than they are. But Moses intercedes for the people. It's interesting what happens in Numbers 14, verses, verses 13 to 16. But Moses objected. What will the Egyptians think? What will the Egyptians think when they hear about it? He asked the Lord. They will know full well the power you displayed in rescuing your people from Egypt. Now, if you destroy them, the Egyptians will send a report to the inhabitants of this land who have already heard that you live among your people. They know, Lord, that you've appeared to your people face to face, that your pillar of cloud hovers over them. They know that you go before them in the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Now, if you slaughter all these people with a single blow, the nations that heard of your fame will say, the Lord was not able to bring them into the land he swore to give them. So he killed them in the wilderness. So what's the cost of the Israelites' doubt? They're doubting God's power, and also they're doubting God's promises. 
Numbers 14, 20 says, Then the Lord said, I will pour pardon them as you have requested, but as surely as I live, as surely as the earth is filled with the Lord's glory, not one of these people will ever enter that land. That's a cost. They have all seen my glorious presence and the miraculous signs I performed both in Egypt and in the wilderness. But again and again, they have tested me by refusing to listen to my voice. And then verse 34, because your men explored the land for 40 days, you must wander in the wilderness for 40 years, a year for each day, suffering the consequences of your sins. There were consequences for their doubts. They paid a price. The Israelites could not decide which land they wanted to live in, Canaan or Egypt. So, so let's look in the New Testament to the book of James to see this concept repeated. So in James chapter one, verses two through eight, he talks about faith, which is the opposite of doubt, and endurance. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Now, the Israelites faced trouble, but did not see the opportunity that God placed before them. God wanted to fulfill his promise to them, but all they could see were their troubles. Then verse three, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. Now, okay, and then uh, in verse four, let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Now, you can't just go about willy-nilly treating God like a genie in a bottle. James continues in verse five about how we need to temper this. So, verse 5, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. Yes, we will need God's wisdom to guide us through our times of testing. But if we ask him for it, be confident that he will give you this wisdom. And verse 6, but when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they're unstable in everything they do. So when we ask for God's guidance, we must examine our loyalties. They cannot be divided between God and the world. So how does all this apply to us today? How can we live victoriously in this life and not be hindered by doubt, by wavering? How can we have abundant life that has been promised to us? There are certain basic principles outlined in the scriptures. And first of all, be faithful to the assembling of your church. Faith, the opposite of doubt, comes by hearing the word of God, Romans chapter 10. So be faithful to the assembly of the believers. That looks a bit different right now, but the principle is the same. Join with the church body to hear the word. Connect with your small group. We need one another. Not only do we need the body, but the body needs you. You're an important part. Here's how Peter put it in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 11, about growing in faith. And this scripture really caught my attention. It's something to meditate on over time. When we grow in faith, doubt is crowded out of our lives. There's just not room for it. So 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him, 
the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. Uh, now remember, meditate on the fact that God is equipped. Uh, he has equipped us to live a godly life. Think about where your focus is most of the time. Is it on the marvelous glory and excellence of God? Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So think about where your mind goes most of the time. Is it on God? Verse four. And because of this glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. Hmm. Corruption caused by human desires. There's another whole message right there. So in view of all this in verse five, make every effort to respond to God's promises. We have to remember those promises. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence and moral excellence with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with patient endurance and patient endurance with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love for everyone. Ooh, what a list. So, so let's review that. So starting with faith, these are the things we need to add to it. Moral excellence. God lets us know what that means. Knowledge. We have to keep learning. Self-control. And that's one we can ask God to help us with. Patient endurance. Now, did the Israelites have patient endurance in the wilderness? No. And then godliness. Strive to be more like Jesus. Brotherly affection and love for everyone. Now that goes right back to the principle of love God and love people. Verse 8. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But those who fail to develop in this way are short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins. So verse 10, so dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove that you really are among those God has called and chosen. Do these things and you will never fall away. I'm going to repeat that. Do these things and you will never fall away. Then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So when doubt creeps in, turn to this passage from 2 Peter chapter 1, or go to the list of encouraging scriptures that's being compiled this week. Allow God's promises to replace that doubt. And let, um, you know, don't, don't let doubt become your focus. Remember that all of God's promises are true. And I'd like to close with a Psalm of David, Psalm 25, verses 1 and 2. O Lord, I give my life to you. I trust in you, my God. May these words be true in each of our lives. So for this week, the things that we're focusing on, number one, reflect on the doubts that you struggle with and how God works in spite of them. Number two, go to the Encourage Yourself in the Lord card for a list of verses to help you when you're discouraged. And three, when you're struggling with doubt, what verse of scripture encourages you? Go to encourage yourself in the Lord at newarkupc.info and let us know what your verse is. Let's pray. Oh Lord, thank you. Thank you for leading and guiding us through this, this crazy time that we're in, Lord. We ask you to help us deal with our doubts by trusting in your promises, Lord. You have everything under control. And Lord, we ask you to keep us while we cannot meet together. And Lord, we look forward to that time when we can meet again face to face 
in person with, with one another, and then, Lord, that time when we meet face to face with you. Be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. So thank you for joining with us this evening. It's always good to get together like this. So return tomorrow evening at 7 for our live Bible study with interactive Q&A, where we'll continue on the topic of doubt. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Sister Debbie, for that wonderful message. I hope you will visit us at newarkupc.info, where you can send in prayer requests, give, and join a small group. You can also engage with us. Think about the doubts you struggle with and how God works things out in the end. When you're dealing with doubt, what scriptures encourage you? I like Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. If you visit our Encourage Yourself in the Lord card, you will find a list of verses that help you when you're feeling doubtful. And you can also share scriptures that help you most during those times. Thank you for joining us. And I hope you have an amazing night. And I love you all.